popping up. <laughs> and you're live. Thank you, Jacob. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's always always a delight to be talking to Jane Ann Krentz and J.T. Ellison. We did a lot of wonderful stuff together during COVID. And one of the things we did was we talked extensively about trends in publishing and specifically the Gothic. So here we have a chance to sort of redo all that. But we're here to talk about The Night Island, which is the second book in a trilogy. So we're in the middle story arc of this book. And Jane, are you finding that you like that structure for storytelling? Because you did one like that uh, fairly recently, too, another trilogy. I do like the trilogy for, for th well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, each book is a standalone mystery it contained within the story. So you don't have to read all three books. But the beauty of the trilogy is that it gives me a cast of characters I can go back to and the reader can find familiar because they know them. From, if they read the other books, they'll know them from the previous book. Um, and there is an overarching story arc that runs through all three books and will be wound up, hopefully, <laughs> Hopefully in the third book. I'm writing it now. It's, this is the part where all the pieces have to come together. All those good ideas I thought I had at various points along the way, I now have to do something with. Um, but it's kind of a fun way to do that, um, to do that story within a story. So I, I, I enjoy the, the process, I guess. Um, JT, have you done those? Have you done trilogies or? Never. Never. And and I love the idea of it. I don't know that I can contain myself to three books. <laughs> my 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 series, because we've talked about this, right? It takes it takes four books for a series to start. So the first three books, that's by the third book, I'm like, oh, this is where I messed up. This is why I can't have this be the storyline, because it would wrap it up. So I guess maybe thinking about it like that, I have. But for the fourth books, I always have to pivot in, in order to keep the story going. So maybe I am just naturally writing in groups of threes and not realizing it. And on the fourth book, you change. Yeah, I think that's yeah. if I were to carry this story forward, that's what I'd do. I'd have to find a whole new problem that would become the next big story arc overhead. Um, people in the audience probably aren't interested in this, but for those of us in the business... <laughs> This is kind of how we work. Well, um, I mean, I think it's interesting that, that you know, a three-act structure, so to speak, is so so prevalent. Um, I mean, how often do you have anybody actually writing? The last person I knew that deliberately wrote a quintet was Dean Kuntz when he wrote his Jane Hawk, and he had a five-book structure, you really? know, yeah. for yeah, for, for Jane. Uh, it just took him longer, I guess, you know, to, to work his way through it. And there's the occasional tetralogy. Um <laughs> I love that word. It's so much fun. I hardly ever get to use it Apologies. in ordinary conversation. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, there are occasionally people that write, you know, like the Alexandria Quartet, Lawrence Durrell's thing, you know, it was deliberately written as four books in order to have a main book and then revolve the story through three other points of view to, you know, which was really, it's a very odd thing to read. If, if either you ever, has either of you ever read it? Uh -uh. No. Well, it's fascinating because he sets out the main story and then he's got three more books in which somebody else tells the main story and you realize that the things you heard in the first book are not necessarily, you know, the real thing. I mean, it's, and he did that. Gosh, when did Daryl write? Um, I can't remember how long ago. I think it was after the war when he moved. So it would have been back in maybe the late 40s or the early 50s. But it was an interesting yes. experiment. That sounds sort of like the Bannerman books where you get three quarters of the story and it, it, you get the whole story, but then the first quarter of the next book is the last quarter of the book <laughs> before from a different point of view. So you got this really interesting yeah. looping continuity through the series. I, I found that structure absolutely fascinating. I don't think that that's really that. I think the point of the Alexandria Quartet was that the truth was different, the entire truth, because it was the whole story each time. Oh, the truth was different according to who was telling you the story. Like the, 
you know, so it was. It was give me ideas. Is that giving you ideas, well, Jane? That's giving me well, ideas. Read it. It's really a fascinating. Um, I loved it. But anyway, and Jane you did think earlier wrote a, a fog think it's a version of me. Sorry? I was going to say, do you think it's a, an early version of what we're now calling the um, unreliable narrator? Well, in a way, but each of them is actually reliable. It's just that they, that, you know, they think differently or their agenda was different. They weren't, it, it isn't like they're deliberately trying to mislead you in okay. the same way that, you know, Gone Girl and everything had spawned. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and then recently there are two new books out. One's Alex Michaelides, The Furies, and the other is Anna O oh by Matthew Blake. And I did his, uh, I did an event for him last week. And I don't want to spoil them by being two things, but but there there is that the narrator is unreliable for a different reason. Okay. Um, in both, and there it's it's quite interesting. In the silent patient was also like that. So mm -hmm. you know, I I think it's such a different thing for crime fiction, you know, because back wow. in the old days you had the cop or you had the PI or you know, and you trusted Kinsey. Right. You didn't think Kinsey Milhone was lying to you yeah. or, you know, wasn't um, wasn't actually like working her way forward through a case. And it seemed to me that really ever since Gone Girl, that whole that whole thing is kind of shattered. And you don't see that many police procedurals or P.I. stories right now. No, not right now. I agree. I I, um, I think it's really gone <laughs> All the way into uh, into horror, light and gothic, some kind of mix of gothic with the real supernatural stuff. Being, you know, in the in the old in the traditional twentieth century gothic, it was always there was a logical explanation for the ghostly behavior. You're usually you, but now that's gone. I mean, now there's actual ghosts and actual um, elements of horror that that uh, have have become part of the mystery genre. I think I don't know that the people who love outright horror would really like these stories. I think this is more for the mystery reader and the says the queen of so, the paranormal elements in her book. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, this is you've got you've got paranormal and you've got the gothic and you've got the horror. You've got it all built in here. So I actually went and did a little bit of research. I know y'all are shocked to hear me say that. Um about <laughs> about the suspense and the horror. I know y'all. <laughs> what a waste of time. Why would you even go there? <laughs> well, I'm I was curious about I was curious about suspense in horror and horror in suspense. And I found a Reddit forum that, I mean, let's take it right from the people who are reading it, right? Yeah. And half of them are like, no, we don't want horror in suspense. We want horror to be horror and they want body horror. I've never heard that term before, body horror, body which horror. is body horror, which is what you, you've sort of done here in, 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 uh, an element of of body horror with mm -hmm. psychic assassins you've done a bit but it's like zombies and oh uh, okay vampires or whatever disgusting ch titillating changes to the physical being to make them horrifying so frankenstein would be body horror but it would That's be like cozy body horror if that cozy makes any sense <laughs> it's a whole new genre cozy body a whole horror. new genre for yeah. us now Right. But I thought I thought it was really interesting that the horror folks are like, hey, keep your suspense out of our horror. Yeah, because, that's what I know. that's what I see happening. That's what I think will happen from that side of the fence. I don't <laughs> think they're going to accept it. Um, and especially since so much of the, the stuff, at least the stuff I've been reading, um, features a female centric character. Um, it, it's once a, it's it's gothic in that tradition. There's following that gothic tradition. Um but everything else that we identified months ago is still there. You know, the element of, am I seeing things? You know, element of madness and the isolation. The, uh, there's always an isolated situation and the threat's always from within. Those are the three things that we yeah. decided yeah, to find. Alice, out. Alice Beanie's Daisy Darker is an example of that. And Rachel Hawkins' book that we'll be talking to her here next Hello. week Harris, um, is, you know, is the same, but in, at least in the eras, there really is a, a logic behind it all. You know, Daisy Darker, you have to, you know, you have to 
wing it more. Or Riley Sager, who took a deep dive into the bottom of a lake, remember? Yes. Had, you know, had an actual, you know. <laughs> it worked. I mean, the readers loved it. Readers did love it. And, you know, I was trapped in Boston by American Airlines. It wasn't really the, the weather on Sunday. It was American and their equipment failure. But at least it wasn't Alaska Airlines with, you know, the unfortunate door falling up. <laughs> but anyway, desperate for something to read for my whole day and night in the airport. I bought a copy of Iron Flame, the Rebecca oh, Yarrow yeah. book, because, you know, I don't I don't have to I don't normally read books that are bestsellers like that if we don't have an attachment or an event with the author because they just sort of sell themselves and I focus on the books that need me. And I was really interested to find out what was going on. And of course, they're dragons who can resist that. But here's the thing. It's completely illogical for her to have started out with a group of people that are going to be trained to defend the kingdom and all and have them walk over in slick boots with backpacks, a slick parapet, so that some of them will slip and fall to their death before they ever even get to the other side in the training program. And I thought, I just, it's a complete lapse of logic. <laughs> Dave and I talked about it, you know, we're, we're reading at the airport and I thought, what, why? You know, why would you deliberately start out by winnowing your herd through sheer accident? It wasn't, had nothing to do with merit, you know, if you fell off the bridge, why would you do that if you were, Design, you know, your whole object was to take a, a group of youngsters and train them. I mean, you know, they have to be over. able to walk on the back of a dragon while it's flying. And if you can't walk <laughs> across the uh, parapet, you are uh, not a dragon rider. <laughs> uh, there is logic to it. Okay. There's there is logic. There is a reason. That is then that is the reason. You have to be able your 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 dragons are battle dragons. Right. You're in battle. You need to be able to unseat yourself and move around on the dragon whilst it's flying in usually a storm. <laughs> um, and and keep your keep your feet. And so if you can't walk the parapet, you can't walk the back of a dragon. Okay. So why wouldn't you give at least people boots with a fighting chance? Instead of this like soul thing, right? I mean, there's you know because Sorry, then you I just kill just, all the people. <laughs> it's ruthless. It's absolutely ruthless. Yeah, no, it is. I don't know how. I don't want to spoil anything, but a lot of the kids that are going across the parapet, they want to lose. They want the. It's a. I don't know how far you got into it. There is definitely I read the a, whole book. Okay, I so all so day it's in the, the Boston airport, believe okay, me. So half the, the right, perfect. half the people that are coming there are their enemies. So they want them to die. Ooh. So it, it eliminates their enemies. I'm telling you, y'all, yeah. I could talk about this all night. And we're here to talk about Jane, so don't get me started <laughs> on the dragon. Right. We digress. Right. Maybe Jane, I'm in love with the dragon. I will do a special Rebecca Yarrow seminar event <laughs> after I finish. <laughs> we'll see. But yeah. anyway, what my point was that I was really I, I wondered if mystery readers would really accept that. You know, you do you have given it sort of a logical thing. But I thought, okay, maybe the difference is that fantasy readers are are prepared to believe anything. You know, it doesn't have to have any any logic, logic. or whatever it might be. And whereas mystery readers, or at least older mystery readers, such as myself, really liked it if there was some, you know logical cases, whatever so this whole deal that we've talked about about the gothic coming on and all the rest of it makes it harder to find you know that sort of that sort of book right now it just isn't really i i got i have a feeling that it, you know we've seen genres ebb and flow they never go away but they do ebb and flow and we're probably just in the a slack time for the classic procedural kind of the, the classic FBI story. I think you're right. I actually yeah, had a book launch for James Patterson last night. I get to do one about one a year or something like that. And his discussion of why he's created uh, Holmes, Marple, and Poe, I won't go into why, um, was because he said the same thing that, you know, they, these are real detectives, you know, you have to, I mean, they're descendants oh, yeah. of, you know, I know, but, but, but the point was that they are doing actual detecting, you know, mm -hmm. they are, and, and it's kind of a reset, a modern reset of these classic characters. Um, and he too said that he thought that so many of these, of the kind of book we were just talking about are, there are too many of them 
and many of them are so illogical or not well written or something that, you know, remember the Da Vinci clones when, you know, every book was a religious conspiracy thriller for like five years. Eventually it wears it out, right? Yeah, and then yeah. people say, all right, what are we going to read next? So I'll be intrigued to see whether um, how long this romanticy thing, you know, has taken hold. But what we're actually here to talk about is the night out. <laughs> so maybe we should go back to that just for fun. Well, I, I can say that that's the fine line I walk when I write these books. Yeah. Which is, yes, I like the psychic element. And I would like to make it clear that I don't do the supernatural in the sense of the classic magic and witchcraft and dragons and such. Um, for me, the psychic element works because it's just one step beyond intuition. And most people can make that leap from intuition to a little more of a of a vibe, you know, if you will. Um, but I always like that the crime gets solved with some real uh, detective work. It doesn't get solved completely by um, the supernatural element stepping in or the psychic elements, uh, and and they and even if they get a clue from their intuition about something, they have to prove it. They have to find the evidence. It's so I'm kind of on that line. I understand the the pull of just being able to make the psychic all the answer, but but that's no fun for me as the for a plot, you know, um, it's, and that's where that's where your amnesia comes into this yeah. too. Good old amnesia. I mean, you <laughs> throw so many impediments in their way. I mean, it's I don't know. I really liked I liked Talia a lot, and I liked Luke a lot, and I thought Thanks. they were incredibly rich characters on their own, and very very rich characters together. Um, I was oh, like thanks. Jane. Jane, <laughs> oh my! I am still. I'm There's still... some really great physical scenes in here. I think really, that's, that's yes, cool. there is even one good sex scene. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, and Jane also brings um, podcasting in, and you know, as we have kind of lost the old style PI because they've been replaced largely by digital, you know, whatevers. I, I think podcasting more and more, you're finding podcasters um, as leads in crime solving in books. It's it's the perfect amateur sleuth, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, everybody loves the amateur sleuth story and podcast takes it into the modern era where it does. I agree. It's sort of like a, you know, a, it's a less boring PI than just sitting in front of a screen. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. you know, um, and also they attract you know, crowd crowdsourcing um, a lot of it. So it's ideal for cold cases. I think it works particularly well for cold cases. You know? And, and, and there's of, also a, a, oh, sorry, a ramped up uh, element of danger for them because even a PI is going to have resources and a weapon. A podcaster is kind of on their own. So yeah. if somebody comes after them, they're really going to be in trouble. That's, no, the, that's, amateur, that's the amateur thing. That's the amateur going up against the bad guy. And that's that's just a, such an alluring story. I mean, we all love it because I guess because we can step into those shoes. So the of... Last Night Files trilogy started with Sleep No More, right? Mm -hmm. So why yeah. don't you give us, you know, for people who might not have read Sleep No More, why don't you give us the gist of that and then we can move into the Night Island. Okay. Well, the premise of the whole trilogy is that three women who did not know each other walk into an abandoned, or I should say, a the ruins of an old hotel that is scheduled to be redeveloped and turned into a modern luxury resort. And they all think they're there for a job interview, essentially. And they walk it through the doors into the lobby, and they don't remember a thing until the next morning when they wake up in the middle of an earthquake. This is California. <laughs> middle of an earthquake and a, and a fire that has been started in the, in the ruins. Um, so they barely escape with their lives and they have no, no, the three of them have no memory of what happened. So the podcast essentially is how they set about trying to find out what happened to them. Because when they woke up that morning, they all had some kind of a psychic talent that they did not have when they got locked into the hotel. And they're dealing with that. And that's kind of where I go into the gothic -y, am I seeing things? So I really can I really see auras or is this my imagination? You know, if what they, they question those powers that they have because they're unsettling and they don't, 
no. And then ultimately, um, the, the idea with the trilogy is that each of the three women gets her own story and her own romance and her own mystery. And that's, and then at the, at the end, they'll all kind of come together to solve the major crime. Who's doing this to them? Right. Well, you think you can wrap that up in one more book, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, but you do give us some clues in this book about what happened to them and yeah. why they have these um, enhanced, you know, psychic ability. Because um, what they're looking for in this is a list um, in part. You know, they're trying to figure out, are they the only people that um, have had this experience and how are they selected for? Because it appears that they were actually targeted. It wasn't just random that the three of them were invited to show up for the quote job interview. Um, right. And I would like to thank Jane Ann because um, while this is ostensibly based in Seattle or you know the islands, there are numerous references to Phoenix. So <laughs> you spend a fair amount of time in Phoenix in this. And yet, you know, if you're thinking psychic, most of us in Arizona think A, Sedona, or B, Quartzite, which is, you know, the sort of low rent district of psychic. It's the trailer park version of Sedona, which is the very high rent part. Um, and, you know, I, I find it fascinating that uh, we have these really fairly intense communities here, you know, that people truly believe in ley lines and, you know, all this other stuff. But anyway, thank you for taking us to Phoenix because <laughs> it was fun. Well, I I was born and raised actually in the Southern California desert, uh, De Anza Borrego. Right. And I've just always got a soft spot for deserts. I don't know why there's something, I'll, you know, it'll, it's the light. If there's something about the desert and the, and the light that up uh, that's the, the son of my childhood i guess and she lives in seattle where she points yeah. out <laughs> the book, there's no sun until like, no you know sun nine anymore. in the morning you you reference the, the lack of sun and whatever <laughs> several times yeah. so did you write this book during the winter season during the winter <laughs> i figured you must have <laughs> so, yeah um, that that was a heavy influence on the storyline oh yeah it's um it's just so different and we're not that far apart geographically but the sun is really different up here than it is in the southern that's true so. uh, the, the temperature thing is really weird i forgot to say that jane ann is very kindly signed as she frequently does actually forever has done the night islands so i'm holding up one of our autograph copies and that's what we have at the poison pad so you don't want to miss out on that right and before we go any further and i forget jt has some really interesting news about what she's going to do um publishing so why don't we break into that moment jt and then we'll come back to the night island what's my interesting news <laughs> Well, you're you going to tell them and, oh, okay. that good stuff. I don't know that you know. I was like, oh my gosh, were you in my bullet journal as I was writing stuff today? No, I was writing stuff. <laughs> no but I think, you know, it, I'm not at all clear that everybody who reads you and loves your books knows about your, your you know, new publisher and what you're doing. Yes. I do have a new publisher. I'm so excited. I have moved to Amazon Publishing in the Thomas and Mercer imprint. And the first book is called A Very Bad Thing, and it will be out in September. And I am in the thick of the copy edits, and I had a brilliant copy editor, um, which was wonderful, a wonderful experience. It's, it's. I'm really excited. I, I can't wait to, to see what happens next. And as soon as I get that done, I'm starting the next book. Um, so they're both standalones, but hopefully there will be there will be more of all the things all the things there's a there's a pi there happens to be speaking of a pi in this book who the copy editor very kindly pointed out that wow she could have her own series I'm like <laughs> oh no. and there no, you go wink wink, you go. wink, wink <laughs> nod nod so so yeah it's um it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun i'm really i'm really excited and i'm really happy and everything is hopping along that's great. But she also has fallen victim to the sort of psychic world and so forth. So writing a different series and publishing right. it with a, a different publisher, she has presented us with Jane Thorne's CIA librarian spy, which you have to know right off the bat is not grounded in reality. But not still, grounded in reality. <laughs> um, but it's fun. We have all three volumes at the Poison Pen signed by 
by JT under that name. And are you working on a fourth one for that? Um, actually, the fourth just came out, just came out. And I just sent you a box. Yes, you were gone. You were oh. gone. Hanging out in out. Boston in the airport, right? <laughs> okay, right. Oh, uh, well, okay. I'm Same. actually working on the fifth. The fifth one, um, I think, I, I'm not putting a date <laughs> on it, but I'm thinking end of April. Um, the first half of that is done. And I'm working with a new co-writer and I adore her and we're having a ball. So as always. And, and publishing it, so to speak, on your own, you can. Yeah, that's it. That goes indie through my through uh, Two Tails Press. Yeah, but you can control the Two Tails Press. You can control, you know, things that you can't do if you're in the hands of a larger right. publisher with other stuff going on. So they can come out more often. Right. Which is very, right. and that's uh, it is. It's nice, and and as you you know, as you can see, <laughs> I'm not quite sure of the date. I'm not going to set a date until the book's done, and then I'll be like, okay, we're ready to go, and I can put it on sale. It's it's incredible. The you know we've got such a lag time. Jane has this too. She's you know she's writing the next book, and it's not going to come out for another year or so, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so it's it is the whole world is speeding up. So you know it, it's interesting that. Yeah. We have tools now where you can actually do something like Two Tails Press and make a success out of it where it would have been impossible yeah. probably 30 years ago anyway. Yeah, no, it's true. Ingram's I'm trying to remember when I, Yeah, I'm trying to remember when I started the store if there was anything like that. Back I don't in, think so. No, but there were a lot of very... The big publishers weren't those huge conglomerates. They were a lot smaller and a lot more yes. agile. So and that's, and that's how point. people like me got into publishing, uh, because we, there were places right. where you could go over, still go, <clears throat> what they say, submit over the transom. You know, you right. could, you can't do that now. There's no, just, there were slush piles and, you know, people no. get their start as editors by reading manuscripts that came in over the transom, the slush Not pile, anymore. all that no. romance. So now know. the slush pile are the indie books that are published that are super successful. I mean, the, yeah. they're plucking, they're plucking the print rights out from the really successful fantasy authors. Okay. Um, you know, Carissa Broadbent, perfect example. That book's been on the list for the past few weeks and, and she has this huge following and they've put her out in print and it's reboosted everything. I mean, they're, they're definitely looking, um, Looking right. at that now is quite yeah, publishers interesting. are actually rating, you know, indie books and all to see rating. which ones are successful. Good yeah. word, rating. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, rating. I use that word deliberately, but there we go. <laughs> all right. So back to the night island. So the island is in uh what is it? It's in Puget Sound. Yeah. Well, yeah, the San Juans. It, it's off okay. the coast. Yeah. It's um a string of they might Big and little, there's probably maybe a, over a hundred islands there. Some of yeah. them are just rocks, you know what I mean? They, sure. but, but there's enough of them so that for an old clandestine government uh, project like the Manhattan Project, except for psychic stuff, um, you could you could hide one on an island and people wouldn't have discovered it particularly until recently. You know, everything underground and and uh and the thing, the thing I like about writing this, the psychic stuff, is that it's close enough to reality. Um, <laughs> when you go to do the research, all you have to do is open the cupboard door and it just falls out. I mean, the U.S. government spent decades and gosh knows how much money trying to find or use the power of psychic research for spies and, right. and war materials and things like that. It was a lot of money and talent got dedicated to trying to make, prove it actually existed and the russians were doing the same thing at the same time so there was an arms race in the psychic world throughout a lot of the 20th century and probably know it's still going on but they don't tell us that's the yeah, beauty they're part. probably now enhancing it with drug research you know because i mean as they you know the phenomenal advances in medical applications of you know drug research now we have the weight loss drugs and you know we got a covid vaccine in a surprisingly short time all the rest of it so i feel like you know they're probably diligently at work trying to enhance you know well who knows what yeah exactly right. and i and i think it's um the fact that so many scientists in the 20th century really did take it seriously for for years. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the fringe thing that we kind of think of it now, or the the 
the storefront psychic, you know, who reads palms. It wasn't that kind of research. It was serious research. And they ran into an interesting problem, which is still out there, which is <laughs> there's no way to measure. We don't have the technology. If it does exist, we don't have the technology to actually measure psychic energy or paranormal energy because our machines don't, re you know, it's like right. trying to trying to take a temperature for something that doesn't go below zero, you know, and, and you're looking at below zero. So, uh, but there's a big school of ghost hunting. There's the whole thing about the second sight, you know, the Scottish thing. I mean, so, you know, it is, that well, sort of thing has existed forever about fortune telling and scrying and, you know, all the rest of it. And maybe there are people who, for one reason or another, you know, have some sort of ability Maybe it's just based on character reading or, you know, whatever, you know, a person who's really alert could kind of predict whether someone was going to self-destruct or whether they were going to, you know, it may have just been an enhanced ability to to read people rather than any actual future, you know. Yeah. And when, you, and when you think about it, um, we accept energy we can't really identify all the time in our daily life. Um, the energy of music, you know, I mean, that there's real energy in music and it can go up, bring your, your mood up or take your mood down. It can make you sad. I mean, there's a lot of energy involved in music. And how many times have we said, I don't want to be around that person. They're just dragging me down, you know, just low energy, just negative energy. I don't want, I don't need that negative energy in my life. But how would you ever measure it? You can sort of sense it. But there's no way to measure negative energy coming out of another person. <laughs> Luckily, we're all positive. But you know. <laughs> yeah, well, Tal I, I thought that Talia actually points that out. She points out that they're talking about negative energy, bad energy, and the island has bad energy. She goes, "There's no such thing as good or bad energy. It just is." Yeah, yeah, and that's yes. that's kind of the the science of it is <laughs> my science <laughs> i do basically i do take i do make rules for myself and try to stick with the rules um and that's my science of if if there is paranormal energy out there it's just energy it's like electricity or anything else and uh you, it's up to you it's up just to having you figure out how to access it will you talk about the title of the night island and and what what happen you you go full bore on the gothic here you really leaned into the gothic you've got an island you've got no way to communicate with land and you've got a storm that comes in and there is something else going on with the island that was just fabulous can <laughs> yeah. you talk about it without giving anything away well let's just say that the island was once used by a secret government agency for experimentation with foliage <laughs> and things have gone horribly wrong. <laughs> I was wondering if, if maybe your reading of the mushroom book uh, <laughs> influenced this at all. <laughs> oh, oh, I've been drawing for that book for five years. When did it first come out? I can't remember now. The, the book she's talking about is Merlin Sheldrake's, um, what is it, Fungi? Fungi Changing... Uh, Sheldrake is the last name of the, I, his yeah, name I remember, I, but it's um, how mushrooms basically affect everything on the planet. And they're and they're actually kind of running the world from underground, and we just don't know it. So um, that book has just been a source of inspiration, not only for me but for a lot of other writers. I might point out. There's a new book, Entangled yeah, Life. It's called Entangled Life. Entangled okay. Life. Yes. Entangled yes. Life. I yep. love it because it runs around. There's a new book out called Delectable Poisons, which you might want to. It's yeah. had some great cool. reviews. I've read it. Um, and it does talk about, um, you know, stuff that you would be fascinated by. Okay. So in this book, is there, since we've mentioned foliage, is there something of a vegetarian theme, <laughs> and maybe even vegetarian? Yeah. The heroine is, is, is a foodie. What can I say? And they are, they can be, um entertaining and they can be very annoying <laughs> <laughs> and so the heroes the heroes on the verge of finding her finding it very annoying <laughs> anyhow she everything gets she just got a real uh thing for uh good food but she specializes in vegetarian cuisine which is an interest of mine so that's why that's in in that's why i gave her that trait 
I don't do that. I don't cook that well, but <laughs> but I'd like to. I have to say the biscuits for breakfast are pretty mouthwatering. <laughs> I know, so, you know, our, two of our lead characters, Luke and, Luke and Talia, um, decide they're going to meet and talk over their inauspicious first meeting um, at a coffee shop that specializes in great biscuits and she's slathering butter on the biscuit. Yeah. Um, I got to, yeah. But it, what's better than a biscuit with butter all over? It? Oh boy. I know. I would kind food. of want that polenta casserole recipe. That looked <laughs> really good. She And, and the, the cauliflower, she makes that great cauliflower and says, oh yeah, I've got a tahini sauce. I'm like, oh yeah, I have a tahini sauce laying around. Right. <laughs> you know? Polenta is great. Polenta, you can do anything with. Oh, you know? I'm I'm on a polenta kick right now. So I when I saw polenta. that dish, I was like, oh, I are you going to do a canyon cookbook for us so we can get some of these recipes? Night Island cookbook. Oh, great idea. Well, and, <laughs> and who has just started up a cookbook box of the month club? Yes. Yes, we have. Right well, there um, it's there. actually not so much a box of the month club as an actual meeting where oh. they have to thresh it out on January 27th. But the idea is that they are going to get together, <clears throat> excuse me, and come up with a format. And then each time they will pick a cookbook and people will make recipes from the cookbook and, ah. you know, bring it in. Um, so we funny. kind of push the joy of cooking because we figured most people have it. Um but, you know, to carry on, yes, a logical extension would be that if, you know, if it if the cookbook is much admired and the recipe and all is that people could then buy the cookbook. Mm -hmm. um, we, oddly enough, sell a ton of them every fall. We have a whole section of the store and between October and Christmas, there's a huge turnover in cookbooks and also drink books. You know, I mean, it could be wine, could be coffee, could be tea, um, but, you know, and that's kind of a a thing with, you know, reading anyway is, you know, hot beverage, tea, you know, <laughs> your brew, your your whatever it is. I actually bought a cozy chai tea from a company called Tiesta Tea, which we've been selling. And I've had it myself and it's really good and has good things in it for you, like cloves and ginger and, you know, cinnamon and so forth. But it, it looks really nice. There's a whole lot of actual cozies that have tea. Yes. you know, on the cover or tea themes or whatever it might be. Not so much coffee. I wonder if there's just too much caffeine for cozies. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> but I mean, it's rare that you see a coffee. Well, there, there are a few. Um, but You're right, though. Tea is the yeah. Tea is the scene I, that comes to mind when you think of cozy. It does. Yeah. So, sure. you know, it so, probably goes anyway. back to the, that Agatha Christie uh, or the Miss Marple sort of character, you know, the British... Yeah, I'm going to pause and recommend a book called The Busy Body, which we are going to host the author on January 31st. And the guy that we'll talk about podcasts here, um, the All About Agatha podcast, he's the author. And it involves a ghostwriter and a senator based on Margaret Chase Smith living in May and stuff that happens. Um, but he has some fabulous stuff about publishing and characters. And one of the things Dana and I just absolutely love this. I read it to her. He's talking about sidekicks and how sidekicks are not necessarily, um, are not, ne are not, not necessarily, by design, are not going to be as clever as, say, Poirot or Sherlock Holmes. And then he said, and then there's Miss Marple. And this is my favorite line. Miss Marple, he says, works alone. <laughs> I think that's the best title for a book. I want somebody to write a book called Miss Marvel Works, Works Alone. It's called the Beast. Did you say the Beast Sting? No, it's called the Busy Body. Oh, the Busy Body. The Busy Where Body from, from Kensington. But I mean, there it's, there's so many things, and I'll send you each a copy because there's so many things in it that you will love. Um, and I hope it's the start of a series. But um, you know, I, I think it's interesting. This is the guy who has, you know, hosts a podcast and now he's turning it into there's nobody podcasting in the book. You know, instead it's a ghostwriter, which is another whole thing going on in yeah. public that we're not. Yeah. 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 But anyway, it was it's just it's a cozy, but it's a cozy that is not, you know, silly cozy, but it's got great stuff about publishing and so forth in it. So Sounds another presentation. Awesome. Okay. I also want to point out that Jane, because um, we've talked about this too early on in this book, mentions the dark academic. 
as a genre that is, you know, <laughs> and boy, does that that have a lot of, you know, relevance at the moment. Yeah. I, I don't know how, I mean, have you got a theory of why that became such a thing? Because in a sense, you know, it's always the college campus thing. It's always back to the. Well, you know, I think it's kind of a version of the of the country house thing. The college campus is, you know, yeah. a kind of enclosed community. And, you know, you're expecting people to be interested in learning and behaving well. And so, I mean, <laughs> we can go all the way back to Donna Tart, you know, but it's just and there was the movie with Robin Williams, the name of which I can't remember about, you know, terrible oh, things um... on campus. Yeah. But whatever. But I think I think it's because the campus is supposed to be or was supposed to be a place of safety and aspiration and people dedicated to learning and so forth. And instead, we're finding out, you know, in these books, you remembered the name. Dead, Dead Poets Society. Dead Poets Society. Thank you. Um, and so I think it's that contrast. But then, you know, uh, when you look at the Idaho murders or all the school shootings or whatever, I think we have to acknowledge that that whole idea of a safe place to go, you know, um, for our children or even for us as adults has been blasted to bits. It's kind of like the adult version or a more semi-adult version of um God, what's the what's the famous psychological treatise? The boys are abandoned on an island and, and they turn on each other. Probably, um, yeah, William Golding. Um, you know, we're all girls wow, what is we had tea, not coffee, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I'll look it up. It's it's but, by William Golding, G O L D I Fly, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Lord of the flies. Okay. Lord of the flies. He gets more points here for memory than I right. know. Are we playing Jeopardy or, or something? I know. It sort of feels I think like I think I think the, the theme though is that young, immature people don't make good decisions. Yes. That, that it it and the decisions that you made in college were not that far out of God, you know um out of high school and and this and the things that happened then gonna come back to haunt you you know 10 years later and I think that's kind of the the horror of it you know it's like things things were things were frightening and and there was a they were all in a pressure cooker mm -hmm. and they were kind of trapped in kind of trapped in there yeah I think we had a lot of writers who also came out of Harry Potter and Gossip Girl yep. at the same time. So they had a lot of cultural impact of the school, right? Oh, so you had the you know, a magical school. You had a high-end, glitzy New York. You know, they're they're so rich. They don't even, you know, who cares about going to class? What's that about? Yeah. And yeah. that combination, I think, also just timing-wise, you know, I'm I'm looking a lot at what the influences are that are bringing all of this out, um, and so and that would that would definitely because it would be. I mean, I'm thinking about the timing for me as well. I missed growing up on Harry Potter, but I certainly you know love the books, love the movies. Go right into okay, that would be really fun to write a school book. You know, and and the timing of that did not did not hurt when I did it. I mean, yeah. I, I think you're right about the bad decisions. I mean, you have, you know, <laughs> people on the cusp of starting their adult lives who are making decisions that can sabotage it forever. And while shame seems to have disappeared as a motive for murder, um, I do think that covering up, you know, some of these really dumb or awful things that you do so that you don't ruin your career, you can't get into law school or whatever it might be, or parental pressure, you know, my kid couldn't do this. Um, in a way, it's kind of a version of the of the old, you know, shame in the in the village kind of a thing that would motivate yeah. Ms. Marple. That's great, JT. I never thought of that till right this moment. But I'm talking to Stacey Willing at Monday night, and hers is in fact on campus and a dark academic mystery about yeah. a girl ask her, ask her if horrible decisions. Yeah, yeah. ask her if that to bring it full circle back to Rebecca Yaros, she did an interview recently and they asked her about why the ages, why she had them be college instead of high school. Right. And, and she said, because girls that age are messy. <laughs> They're messy. 
they're making bad decisions. She goes, one of them's throwing up in the toilet and holding her hair. And the other one's saying, don't you text him? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it, it is a very attractive moment in your life where the consequences aren't so severe, but they're going to teach you a lesson. For sure. And they can have, as Jane Ann pointed out, they can have, you know, rebound into your future. For sure. um, in very serious ways. So once again, coming back to the night island, which we keep leaving. <laughs> so what we have is Talia, who is one of the three podcasters of um, that got the lost night files. And they began all this as a consequence of the first book in this trilogy. So now we have Talia summoned to a house uh, and she arrives with money in order to buy a list which might help make some sort of sense of what happened. And she runs into a guy named Luke. And Luke, we've already learned from a previous chapter, uh, Luke has got an ability to focus his energy and maybe even kill people with it. And so there they are on the porch, each with their knapsack full of money. And <laughs> that's really kind of how this story's going to go. Um, so it's a quest in a way, isn't it? It's a quest for the list. It's it's a quest and it's also a story of two people who have doubts about each other, don't really trust each other completely, but they're going to have to work together to survive. And that's what builds the bond is, is throughout the story, they're realizing they can trust each other literally with their lives. Um, and that's that's the core bond that starts the relationship. And I, during and during this, you then give us clues about why they why the first book happened and what the list is all about, and gradually reveal some identities. So we're all set for book three to see if there's a takedown of the bad guy. Assuming that you know the takedown of the bad guy would, or maybe they'll triumph. I mean, we don't know because Jane's just writing it right now. So I could go when have it. I ever done a book where the bad guy <laughs> triumphs? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and also in your persona as Amanda Quick, are you working on an Amanda Quick book? Because they usually come out in May and Jane Ann Krentz usually comes out in January. Is that still happening? There's no Amanda Quick this year. It's uh, is- In that time slot will be one of my Jane Castles, one of the futuristic. Ah. I'm taking a break. Big break, breaking news here. <laughs> um, I'm taking a break from Amanda Quick for a year or so to see where I want to go next with her. I've always used that name for historicals. Right. So it's kind of identified with that type of story. And, and I've used, I feel like for me, I've used up the 1930s, the, 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 the myth of the 1930s that I was pulling on, which is the glamorous side of of California, the, the glamour, not the cold. The Hollywood kind of side. Yeah. The Hollywood version of, of the 1930s. Because I love the repartee, I love the clothes. You know, they created the myth. I just ran with it. But I was working with a very narrow time period, literally like 1937, 38, because I didn't want to get too close to the war and I didn't want to go backward in time to the um, the worst of the Depression. Yeah. And so I just kind of ran out of stories there. <laughs> sure. I, I, um, so I am now looking for another place to any suggestions where would you like to see amanda quick where's amanda quick now where would amanda quick go next i'm looking for a time period that feels right for my kind of heroines which is the first the first requirement sassy that's a really that's a really good point i agree with you that they're you know mining the 30s um you do have boundaries on either end if you don't want I feel the same way about people, you know, who write the Gilded Age historicals. You know, you know, 1914 is just right there. In fact, the John Singer Sargent show, which is the reason I was in Boston, um, was to see it. And you could really see it in the paintings, you know, because they, the, he stops writing, doing those beautiful portraits, mostly with the war. And he moved on to landscapes and so forth. Really? And, yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, the people with those fabulous dresses and all the jewels and, you know, all the rest of it, the war pretty much, you know, killed that way of life. And then we got the 20s and it would be completely different. I mean, yeah. one of his things is painting fabric and, you know, so Sybil Sassoon or um, and in my Instagram post, I, I actually put up my favorite of all, his ability that. to paint black. And, you know, and then make like the shocking pink or whatever it is. I'll show it. I mean, I think this is, you can see it. 
just yeah. an astounding portrait. But it's really, it's about the clothes, right? Yeah. The contrast between, and, and the black has so many shades in it. Can you see yeah. it, JT? Yeah, no, it's That's gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah, and the peach, and there's a, an earlier one in the show. So Diana wrote and said to me, she had read that this was basically a fashion show in portraits. But but the but it ends with the war, you know, and the it and it just has to be completely different after that. And I think for him that was the problem. And for you, I agree. Yeah. And I'm not I don't want to write a war story. So um I was interested that Jackie Winsbury actually did go on and take Maisie Dobbs into the war because yeah. you know, yeah. way back in the beginning when she and I first talked about it, she wasn't gonna do that. Really? You know, at some yeah. point. You have to leave the 30s if you're going to write that long a series. And so if you leave it, you know, you're you're in the war, right? Yeah, I think that. So that's the reason I'm giving it a break while I decide what where to go with it next. Um, okay. So what's Jane Castle? I'm sorry. Yeah. Jane Castle going to be up to. So Jane Castle is going to continue with the futuristic, the harmony world, the dust bunnies. <laughs> Locked in the dust, the dust bunnies. bunnies. They were so great. <laughs> I also think it's interesting that you wrote one book by Jane Ann Crince and Jane Castle together. <laughs> no going back. Why did you do that? It, it's actually two two novellas that they. Oh, is that what they, it is? Okay. Yeah, it's not one story. It's one novella is Jane Ann Crince and one is uh, Jane Castle, and they stuck them together. It was a marketing thing. It's had oh, okay, <laughs> all right, that makes sense. But you've written a lot of Jane Castles, so you know. Yeah. Well, it, it it actually happens to be my birth name. Is it? Uh huh. And I managed to sign it away when I was in my very first contract <laughs> and I lost it for 10 years. And by the time I got it back, I was writing under the other names. So yeah. Reprehensible. That back, back in the day when I didn't think I need, well, it wasn't that I didn't think I needed an agent. It's just, that it was hard to get one. It's always yeah. hard to get an agent. So, um, and there was an offer. i turned in the book over the transom you know I'd mailed it in and somebody wanted to buy it and what are you gonna do when you're starting out you sign the contract so yeah all right so you got it back it all ended well yeah you know what happened the publisher went down that that was Dell do you remember Dell publishing Barbara? I do. they were they got absorbed into Penguin Random House it was yeah. Dell and then it was Bantam Dell Doubleday and Delacourt you know it's a constantly shifting landscape yeah. But yeah. you've been with Berkeley now for a long time. Yeah, I'm really happy there. It's a, I have a fabulous editor, Cindy Wong. She's just she's just amazing, and it's been a very supportive house. You know, career wise, they right. pull through on what they promise they'll do, and they get the books out, and they're really yeah. really committed to publishing. So, and I also wanted to mention because I think they do a really nice job with your covers. You know, yeah, I love the Amanda Quick 1930s covers because the clothes, the yeah. clothes were fabulous. <laughs> they were so good. But you know, the use of color and all the rest of it, I think they do a very nice job for you. Well, they really support their art department. They consider that a vital part of the pro, you know, the production process. And in JP, um, you will probably see that Amazon not only does a really nice job with the covers, but they also do the books underneath the cover. I learned the hard way talking to Lou Ann Rice that I always need to take the cover off the book. Oh, yeah. That's I exciting. mean, it's like an extra surprise, you know. Uh -huh. So pay attention to that. I don't know that they do it for everything, but. Um, but I like well, that. definitely. I mean, you know, not all That's books. Exciting. I mean, for years, books didn't necessarily have dust jackets. You know, what you got was a really beautiful book. When we were in Switzerland in December, uh, we went to the library at the Abbey of St. Gallen in Switzerland, which is one of the most gorgeous. I mean, it's like the Abbey of Milk in Austria. And, you know, there's all this book binding and all these gorgeous covers they made, you know, for early books where you see they sewed the signatures together and then they, you know, they did the boards, but they didn't have dust jackets. You know, they had these gorgeous, you know, leather or metal or whatever it is. And, you know, it was so beautiful. Wow. An object, an a, a, a objet d'art or something. Yeah. It's a, they were. Yeah. well, and I think that the love of the, of the book is coming back. This younger generation seems to want paper. You know, yeah. I read that, that they've done some surveys and shown that Gen X readers really want to read in paper. And I have a theory, which is that they are forced to spend so much of their life digitally 
that it isn't a novelty. And, you know, it's the paper is a break. Whereas when ebooks first came out, it was, you know, yeah. the other way around. You and, could be uh, right. It makes sense that if, I mean, I associate the, the screen with work. I don't like to read on the screen. Um, either. I'm reading for pleasure. I want to be in my chair with a book. And because the screen has just come to be, if I'm not socializing like I am now, <laughs> but if I'm actually in front of a screen and working. Yeah. I can't remember if I read digitally. My mind does not work that way, you know? And if I read a digital thing, I because, you know, right. I have a magnetic memory, so I remember pages and where I saw stuff and all. Well, you can't do that with a digital file. That's so an interesting observation. If I read one, it just goes right out of my head. So, really? you know, pictures, yep, will say to me, you know, we'll send you the, I say, forget it. You know, send me uh, a bang galley. I don't care what it is or a PDF, but if I don't read it, I won't remember any of it. And then I can't talk to anybody. About that's, it. I do know that um, one of the things that goes missing immediately is the, is the cover. I mean, on a, on a digital book, you're, the cover will be there, but it's for most people, it's a black and white, little black and white square. Uh, yeah. Well, that, I, yeah, since I don't do that, I, I don't yeah. know. That, but yeah. yeah. So you lose the beauty of the book of yeah. or the, the artifact. Well, there's there's some hopeful signs there, you know. Um, so we just have to get through 2024, and then, um, you know, maybe. And I think books will help us. I am absolutely convinced that books are the answer to 2024. <laughs> I read the news or whatever else, you know. Just read one good book after another and have faith, you know, that things will come out okay. And yeah. on that happy note, Jason, why don't you come and Jacob? Sorry, um, come and join us and see if there are any questions. I'm sure the audience found this the most disjointed program they probably ever watched. So <laughs> they know they know we they know we this circle. This is how we roll, yeah. This is how right. we roll. All right, guys. Yeah, we did have a few uh questions. Um looks like they disappeared on me, but I remember a few of them. Um one of them asked if either of you are gonna go to the left coast crime convention this year. I'm not, sadly. I am. I'm actually interviewing the guest of honor, Robert Dugoni, one of my favorite people and wow. Amazon author. Um, so I will be there. And Laurie King is celebrating 30 years of um, bees, Mary Russell, because her first Mary Russell came out then. And she has an all day thing happening on Wednesday. So I agreed to come in and be the anchor on late Wednesday afternoon because we've been together over her entire career scary how how i can say that so often <laughs> looking at authors i've been there for their entire career right. i think it's brilliant i think that's the most special thing about you barbara is you are a part of everybody's careers you have been there it's incredible it's cool well, it's not really everybody cool. but you know i think part of it is that i just love debuts i love finding new voices and so a lot of bookstores aren't willing to take the risk of yeah. trying to deal with the new author, you know, but um, but I'm right there, you know. <laughs> I really, really like it. And also the rest of our staff is such an asset, you know, John, Patrick. Um, it's amazing. You do know that John now has his own YouTube channel. Yeah, I saw that. Right, because he was doing so many um off the books interview, you know, with authors and they got lost. So we thought we'll just we'll just give him his own and he can, you know. Perfect. That's awesome. He's so great. He's such an authority. Ah, yeah. Sorry, J Jacob, back to you. Um, yeah, just a couple more. Uh, one of them was for JT asking about the uh, release of the next book. A Very Bad Thing coming September 3rd. September 3rd is the release date. And hopefully coming to the poison pen along with JT. At least that's my plan. We'll see how it works out. I would, I would love that. Yeah, it's it's actually the story. I haven't talked a lot about what this book is about, but it's about a world famous beloved author who has murdered the last night of tour. <laughs> you will be happy to know that she was at Poison Pen the night before. <laughs> She's murdered in Denver. She is not murdered in Scottsdale. Thank you very much for not making this ground for authors. Oh my God. Right. right. I was very careful about that. Um, and and so I've been a little leery about touring. It's kind of crazy, weird going out on tour, talking about an author who's murdered on tour. But it was, I'd written, the, I'd written a lot of the book before the Salman Rushdie incident. Right. And I actually, you know, st sat back and went, oh, maybe I don't want to write this book because that's yeah. very, 
you know, scary. It's a, it's like the the worst nightmare. It's our worst nightmare, right? Something Mm -hmm. happens while we're on tour. So, but it's, it's all good. It's all good. I made it through. I was fascinated when I think it was before COVID, it must've been before Mm -hmm. COVID. And I don't remember which author it was, but anyway, the author said to me, how I love coming here. You're the only bookstore that doesn't have a resident stalker. And I thought, really? You know, but then it turned out that that was actually true. Um, Is that, it really? Yeah, uh, yeah. That there were indeed many, you know, many stores that had some, you know, hanger on. I don't uh, know that when I say stalker, I don't even know it necessarily was gender specific. You know, it could have been just you know a female fan as well as sure, whatever. sure, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Ah. Right. Great. That's so, totally lovely. Let's you can throw that to- in. Right. No stalker <laughs> at the poison pen. <laughs> no stalkers. <laughs> Love it. Right. Um, so anything else, Jacob? Um, yeah, I, I think that can be it. Okay. Anything you would like to say, Jane Ann? No, except I'm excited about the Night Island. I will add one factoid. It originally was called Night Island. <laughs> Oh, and now it's the Night Island? And my, and my editor said, what if we put a the in front? And it totally changed the title. Yeah, now I see that. Yeah, made Isn't it that interesting fun. how that one little no-name no word, the, made it a whole, made it a more memorable title. I was... It did. I agree. Yeah. Vicky, any wisdom from you? Um, just read all of Jane Ann's books because <laughs> I'm I am in awe of how... You're so established and you are writing such great books and you're breaking new ground. And I felt like this one really broke new ground. I thought it was really, oh, thanks. I, I was telling Randy last night, I'm like, this is really a, one of her best books. I love this. Cause there was just, I'll, you and I'll have to talk separately. Cause there's an element of it that I just really dug, really, really dug. And well, that's I'm really too. looking forward. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to your next suspense. The uh, a very bad thing. That's I love your work. So um, I want to say that Jane Ann is a great stylist, and one of the reasons it's such a pleasure to read her is that she's such a wonderful writer. And I, agree. I, don't, I don't know that we give copy editors any credit, but um, <laughs> it's really nice to read a book that is not, you know, marred Littered. by bad grammar or missing punctuation or any of that crap. Um, The other thing I'd like to say is that I completely forgot to mention today is in fact publication day. Right. Right. So a toast in my water glass. (laughs) So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll shift it. I'll shift it to something here in a few minutes, but anyway, a toast to Jane and her fabulous career publication day. Thank you. Island. And while we still have a few autographed copies, I would definitely grab one from the poison pen. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And um, we'll see you soon. It was fun as always. Loved it. Good night.